solutions to address the grand challenges of humanity. See, I believe in boundless possibility. Human beings are a curious species because we have the ability to conceive of delightful, exotic future scenarios, and we can actually move the popular will. We can pull the present forward and meet and actualize any of those possibilities. That's what we do. We pull the present forward into the future, the future that we create, that we map out. Today, we hear a lot in the media about the energy crisis. We hear a lot about sustainability. We hear a lot about strangleholding the planet. These are all legitimate concerns. But again, doom and gloom has been fatigued. We need solutions. So let's talk about the Solutions Project. The Solutions Project is an amazing new initiative led by Hollywood celebrities, brilliant civil engineers, the popular will of some of the smartest men and women in the world who have come together to leverage their brains to create a plan to take us 100% renewable here in America, literally 50 plans for 50 states by 2050 using technology that already exists today. The proposal is straightforward, eliminate combustion as a source of energy. The sun gives us in one single hour more energy than we would need to power the earth for a year. And the technology used to capture that energy is getting exponentially faster all the time. But the fact that less than 2% of the United States land mass would support all of the wind, solar, and hydroelectric power generation required to meet energy demand is amazing. Now again, it all comes down to the fact that we need to make a cognitive leap. We need to realize this is already possible now, today, with existing technology. You change minds, you change paradigms. So again, I encourage all of you guys to check out the solutionsproject.org. Get educated, get involved, join the conversation. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to do a little bit of a switch in topic while we touched on biofuels a little bit during the general policy discussion. Now we're going to hit it full force and we've got a great panel here. And our moderator today is Ted Heindel and Ted has been referred to a number of times because of his involvement in the planning of the, the whole thing, uh, which we're very pleased about. He's the Burgos Professor of Thermal Science in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Iowa State Engineering. Um, but for this purposes, I think most importantly, he's the, I believe the policy lead, is that correct? And the EPS project, director. project director for EPSCOR and policy lead before that, is that? No, no? okay, sorry. Um, policy lead for the EPSCOR project, which is a joint cross the state effort that, but really does bring a lot of folks together between Iowa and Iowa State. And uh, Ted will be moderating the session this morning. So thank you, Ted. Thank you very much, Pete, for organizing this very uh, interesting panel. And I have a few slides that I'd like to set the stage. Um, so why biofuels? Well, biofuels, as people have alluded to last night and this morning, that they're among the most effective renewable energy options and really the, the only near-term perspective for producing some transportation fuels to bridge the gap between uh, what Professor Jacobson is saying, all electric, to uh, using all the, 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 um, the cars that are currently available um, on the highways. They're derived from living organisms. They've been around for a long, long time. Even diesel, when he first put together his diesel engines, was using peanut oil uh, for uh, his uh, fuel source. And it also provides opportunities for rural development. Just to also put everyone on the same page, there's three definitions of biofuels. There's first generation biofuels, which are produced from crops. Um, Think of corn ethanol, uh, biodiesel from soy. Um, second generation biofuels are better known as cellulosic um, ethanol or um, uh, they're produced from corn stover, grasses, etc. And third generation biofuels are still in the laboratory. They're uh, really produced from algae and, and other organisms of that type. So why are biofuels important to Iowa? Well, this map uh, really tells the whole story. It provides um, biomass availability in terms of metric tons per square kilometer per year. And notice that Iowa is in that epicenter of producing a lot of, of feedstock for the biofuels industry. 
So with that as a stage, this particular panel has four panelists. Uh, one of them is currently not here because Jerry Schnorr teaches until 1130, so he's going to be arriving a little bit late. Um, and each panelist will have 15 minutes to give a presentation. I'm actually going to introduce all the panelists now so they can uh, expedite the, the transition to, to save time. So at the very end, we'll have a lot of time for question and answer. So our first panelist is, is going to be Robert Brown. He's the director of the Bioeconomy Institute at Iowa State University and the Anston Marston Distinguished Professor of Engineering at Iowa State. Um, he's also a professor in mechanical engineering as well as has courtesy appointments in chemical and biological engineering as well as ag and biosystems engineering. Uh, as, a, as a point of reference, he's been recognized by Biofuels Digest as one of the top 100 people in bioenergy for several years in a row. Our second speaker is Nate Green. In your program, we have Daniel O, oh, who is the president of Renewable Energy Group. Daniel uh, had something come up and his, is unable to attend today, and he sent in his place, I'm sure, a very uh, uh, qualified individual in the terms of Nate Green. So Nate is a senior manager of corporate business development of the Renewable Energy Group. Um, REG is the world leader in biodiesel production. Um, he, Nate leads the evaluation of new technologies, strategic ventures, investments and acquisitions, and all legal matters related to REG. Um, he's a former VP of transactions at McBee Strategy Consulting in Washington, D.C., and he started his clean energy uh, focus, uh, focusing or working with a law firm in Iowa in the, that handled biofuel and wind energy projects. Our third speaker is Grant Menke. Grant is the policy director for the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association. Um, he's responsible for federal and state policy development and adv advocacy, uh, the oversight of, of regulatory activities and many other duties at the um, Iowa Renewable Fuels Association. He's a former research assistant for Senator Chuck Grassley in Washington, D.C., and he was also raised on a corn and soybean farm in uh, northwest Iowa. Our final speaker today, as I mentioned, is Jerry Schnorr. Um, he's the Allen and Henry Chair of Engineering at the University of Iowa, and he does teach until 11.30, so he'll be arriving late. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, uh, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering, as well as Occupational and Environmental Health. He's the co-director for the Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research, and he's the editor-in-chief of the Environmental Science and Technology uh, uh, Scholarly Publication. So with that, I would like to turn the, the podium over to Robert Brown, who will start our remarks. Thanks, Ted. Good morning. I've been asked to talk about uh, commercialization of advanced cell cellulosic biofuels. I'm not going to talk about fats and oils. REG's done a great job in commercializing that technology. You'll probably hear some about that from Nate. So I'm going to focus on the cellulosic material, which means things like corn stover, wood chips, grasses. So which pathway? A few years ago, the US Department of Energy decided cellulosic ethanol was the way to go. In fact, most, almost all the research was focused in that area. Um, more recently, they've been convinced to look at other pathways, uh, and it turns out there's quite a number of them as a result of that decision. One of these I'll refer to as the biochemical pathway, the other as the thermal chemical. In fact, there are also pathways that blend the two, and we refer to those as hybrid uh, pathways. I'll mention a few of those as we go along, but for the most part, we'll look at calling them either biochemical, thermal chemical. So that requires some definition. The biochemical conversion uses enzymes and microorganisms to do the conversion of biomass into products. So this, uh, think of um, sugar being fermented into ethanol is a good example of that. Uh, there are products other than ethanol, butanol, terpenes, which would be a, a, a more lipid type of material, and other products. What I've illustrate here is just a representation of how uh, fibrous crops like uh, switchgrass uh, could be pretreated, uh, extract sugar from the cellulosic materials, and then ferment that to ethanol, but there are certainly other possibilities. The uh, strengths and challenges of this uh, platform include several things. Uh, the strengths is it builds upon the grain ethanol industry. That is based on fermenting sugars. 
through ethanol. So it, it's a logical extension of that technology and can build upon that existing uh, industry. It capitalizes on advanced biotechnology. We're all aware of, of all the technologies that is affecting uh, the pharmaceutical industry, uh, and it can also apply in the production of fuels and chemicals from biomass. Uh, it has very high product selectivity, which means most of the sugar goes to ethanol, for example, which means your economics are going to be, look very good from that perspective. There are challenges. Uh, we need to take these cellulosic materials and break them down sufficiently that enzymes can be applied that will convert the cellulose release uh, sugar, simple sugars that can be fermented. Uh, these pretreatments have not been perfected. Uh, yes, there are commercial activities taking place, but perfection means we're going to get as high yields for the minimum cost from that, and that's still an, an area of challenge. Uh, finding the uh, uh, enzymes to convert the cellulose into sugar, uh, these remain expensive. Uh, there have been a lot of advances, but there more are needed. One of the biggest problems is that cellulosic biomass is more than cellulose. It's actually referred to sometimes as lignocellulosic biomass. The ligno uh, is the lignin, and this is a, 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 I'll say uh, when we extract it, it's kind of a dark, tarry material that most microorganisms don't readily uh, utilize. You go out in the woods and see a tree that's decaying. That, that reddish, mat brownish material that you see in a rotting log is the lignin. Not many bugs want to go after that. Uh, so it it's be, it's becomes a side stream that we'd like to look at much higher applica value applications. Then ethanol has reached what's called the blend wall. Uh, we all realize that uh, ethanol, when we buy it at the tank, isn't 100% ethanol. In fact, it is usually about 10% ethanol and the balance being traditional petroleum-derived gasoline. If we want to uh, put more gas, uh, ethanol into our infrastructure, we're going to have to go up to higher levels. 15% uh, has been approved but has not been widely uh, utilized across the United States. It could even go to 85%, but there are a lot of political and infrastructure challenges associated with that. And then all of these plants, uh, tend to have fairly high capital cost, and that's not a, a deal breaker. You can still make money if you have to invest a lot of money, but you've got to have a lot of money to invest to make this work, and that's a challenge in the current economic climate. Let me turn to thermal chemical conversion, and this really has three distinct pathways. The top one, uh, labeled gasification, is the converting of a solid biomass into a gas. Well, we're not interested in gas uh, uh, because it's not gasoline. It's truly a gas. Uh, what we need to do is then convert it by a, a secondary process into fuels. And there's a lot of possibilities, including biological processes called syngas fermentation, as well as catalytic. Uh, fast pyrolysis takes a solid and converts it mostly into liquids. It's sometimes referred to as uh, direct liquefaction. Uh, it can produce uh, a bio oil that can be upgraded using the same kind of technologies that's used by the petroleum industry today. But you can also get sugars from this thermal path as well, and those could be fermented. There's also something called solvent liquefaction, also turning biomass directly into a liquid. Um, but in this case, the biomass is placed in a solvent, and it's essentially put in a pressure cooker to produce the oils or sugars. So a lot of diversity of possibilities in this. With all that diversity, it's hard to characterize a single set of strengths and challenges, but uh, these typically are true. Thermal processes are at high temperature. Processes occur very quickly. So we have what we call high throughput. We can process a lot of material in a small reactor very quickly. There's potential to build upon existing fossil fuel-based infrastructure. If it looks like petroleum, possibly we can process it like petroleum. There's opportunities for energy integration, which is important anytime you're doing um, processes that release heat as well as getting your chemical products, and it utilizes the lignin. Thermal processes can con convert all of the wood, for example, into uh, products uh, as opposed to just the carbohydrate. The challenges is that biomass is more difficult to process than petroleum, and we're, we're learning that every day. 
uh, as we gum up reactors with some of the, the biomass that we use in these processes. Some technologies are not sufficiently developed. This reflects the uh, relative uh, lower amount of investment that has been made in R&D in this area. And it's something that has changed in fairly recent times. And then there are, again, the challenges of high capital cost, which is not a deal breaker, but it makes financing a project difficult. So I'm going to uh, turn to the issue of the commercialization of these technologies. Uh, Biofuels Digest uh, last year uh, wrote a paper on commercialization, and, and I'm pleased to say that it was based on a paper uh, we had published just a, a month before. Uh, and they started looking at some of these issues. And what we did is uh, published a paper in uh, Biofuels, Bioprocessing, Biorefining Journal, where we looked at the technologies that were moving to commercialization, which meant at least uh, 20 million gallons per year. Now, modern ethanol plant today does about 100 million. So these seem kind of small, but they, that's still a lot of, of uh, fuel that would be produced in this fashion. And on the left there is listed the, the six different distinct technologies uh, that uh, are under development at this commercial scale for these cellulosic advanced biofuels. And I'm not going to, uh, to detail uh, each of these technologies other than say it includes gasification, pyrolysis, and solvent liquefaction. Uh, the six commercial activities uh, we detailed the advantages and disadvantages, which I've, I summarized uh, in my earlier slides, but a lot of diversity. Instead, I'd like to look specifically at the companies that are developing these technologies, show that, in fact, there are a lot of companies working in this space today at that kind of scale. And so on the left is the company doing the technology, the technology that they're utilizing, and the status as of uh, the time I prepared these slides uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is particularly for the biochemical conversion. In all cases, the biochemical is converting to ethanol in all of these cases uh, shown here. And what you'll see is uh, some, uh, some remarkable successes, uh, many of them centered here in Iowa. Uh, I start the list with uh, Quad County Corn Processors, a small ethanol plant grain ethanol plant that has put in their own advanced technology and commissioned it uh, just uh, last month. But that also, in that list, you'll go down and see uh, Poet commissioned uh, the same month at a, a larger scale. DuPont will be uh, commissioning later this year. And then there's a number of others. There's, in that list, there's only one uh, straight out failure, and that was by a large petroleum company that, frankly, lost interest when they saw they had other opportunities to make money uh, compared to the return on investment that would uh, rela uh, result from building one of these plants. And I'll talk a little bit more of that as we proceed. Uh, another one is Mascoma, a startup. Uh, they have found a niche market to keep them alive and make money as they de further develop their very novel technology. I've got uh, three, different, three separate slides for the three thermochemical technologies. Gasification, turning biomass into a gas that is then uh, further processed into liquids. Uh, here are quite a range of companies, but you'll note something different. There's a lot of failures in this list, um, but there are also some successes. Uh, there are also some that are trying to find their way. And what you'll see if you, if you study the column on the right, that there's several companies have switched from using biomass as their feedstock for a gasification-based upgrading to using natural gas, which is already a gas and is relatively cheap. And what we've done, uh, I should say, Professor Mark Wright at Iowa State University has done an analysis of the impact of uh, falling uh, natural gas prices on the whole biofuels industry and found industries that uh, were based on gasification suffered the most. There are some others uh, that are actually have an advantage from low natural gas prices, but gasification has been one that has suffered from it uh, and this list type uh, illustrates that. At the same time, I can point out Interchem on this list and Enios, who have both opened uh, commercial scale plants uh, interestingly, both of them are producing ethanol as their product. Now, that doesn't need to be their product. Uh, it's possible to produce 
uh, synthetic gasoline and diesel from these processes, but they've gone to ethanol. Uh, turn to the pyrolysis. Again, taking solid biomass, turning it into a liquid. In this case, uh, we have uh, also a, a mixed bag of, of success and failure here. Uh, most prominent at the top is Kior, which is still going through bankruptcy. They were going to produce gasoline and diesel uh, from biomass, uh, and that uh, that has not been successful. Uh, cool Planet is uh, getting ready to open uh, or start a commercial project in Louisiana. They're using wood. Uh, there are some others on this list that are more at the pilot scale uh, in their activities. So uh, certainly the pyrolysis area is behind the curve compared to the biochemical pathway, but much, doing much better than the gasification. Uh, so the solvent liquefaction was that third area. We put, a, put the biomass in a solvent at high pressure and produce products. And this is also a mixed bag, but there's some interesting uh, distinctions between these companies. Uh, some of them are uh, producing, trying to produce gasoline and diesel. Uh, an example of that is Catch Light Energy. Some of them are trying to produce uh, paper, uh, pulp, cellulosic pulp, as in production of paper products. Uh, ADM is in that category. And some are trying to produce a sugar stream. Rhinmatics at the bottom of the list falls in that category. Uh, all of these are in pilot scale, some of them more, moving more quickly to commercialization than others. So I'm going to turn back to Biofuels Digest that first reported on, on the commercialization work, because then they did their own analysis of why success, some successes, why failures, what makes commercialization successful. And th here's their three points, and I'm going to just state right here None of this is really about uh, the technology itself. What they point out is that there are issues of, uh, that the successful ones are generally integrated with other enterprises. What does that mean? An existing ethanol plant that's already got uh, the infrastructure to take material in, to take product out to markets. That's a big advantage. Those can be very costly. So if it's already there, then that's an advantage. The uh, other successful uh, point of success is there's typically a shared financial burden. Most of these companies are not doing it on their own. There are exceptions to this list, but typically you'll see a lot of joint ventures involved in these activities. And finally, the successful projects have been the ones that are most cost advantaged. And it really comes down to if a company has several opportunities, there are generally going to choose the one with the largest return on investment. An example is the petroleum industry that has invested in biofuels and often canceled those activities because what happened? Uh, the fracking industry opened up something that they were very familiar with, knew how to make money in, and they calculated higher returns on investment fracking to get gas and oil. So these three points are, are very important. So let me just summarize. There are two approaches, uh, biochemical and thermochemical. A lot of progress in the biochemical. Uh, there's a mixed bag in the successes with the thermochemical. And there are th three issues that make this possible. Uh, I've pointed out the large integrated energy companies, re uh, petroleum companies are scaling back uh, because they have other opportunities open to them. And financing is not available for many of, of the smaller companies because they need to make half billion dollar bets. Getting um, investment to do that has proved difficult. So with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Hi there, I'm uh, Nate Green, Senior Manager, Corporate Business Development and also Corporate Legal Counsel at uh, Renewable Energy Group. Daniel O, our President and CEO, was uh, slated to do this presentation. He had an unforeseen conflict come up. Uh, he apologizes that he couldn't make it, um, so you're stuck with me. We are a, uh, REG is a public company. Uh, biofuels is a risky industry, so uh, do your education uh, before you invest. REG, uh, you know, I was asked to come speak today about how to survive and thrive in biofuels. 
And what I'm going to present today, uh, as far as REG as an example of that, uh, is a company that is based around core values uh, to start off with, uh, things like jobs and uh, energy diversity, uh, environmental uh, protection, revitalization of local communities, uh, food then fuel, so uh, building an agriculture base that can provide both fuel uh, and food and switch between those two um, when it's needed. But all that stuff doesn't matter, um, all those core values, if you don't build a business that's durable, reliable, uh, and probably most importantly, profitable. So RG's done that, um, at least to date. You see on the top left uh, table, uh, or I guess figure, uh, our gallons sold uh, have uh, continued to increase. I uh, started back in 2009 uh, with just one plant uh, at the time and have ramped up to last year uh, producing and selling 260 million gallons. You see this year, the first two quarters uh, were uh, on pace to uh, get to about where we were at last year. The revenue growth, uh, it, one thing to know, we did $1.5 in revenue last year. This year, as you can see, it looks like it's tracking lower on an uh, adjusted basis, relative basis. Um, it's actually project projected to be higher if you remove the dollar per gallon blenders tax credit that was in place in 2013 and has since lapsed. You look at the adjusted EBITDA or earnings uh, for the company. Uh, obviously, see back in 2009, we were at the place where a lot of companies that are trying to commercialize technology or really grow a commercial business were uh, losing money, made a little bit of money in 2010, and then the biodiesel industry really took off in 2011, and then that resulted in really three straight years, uh, you know, nearly at 100 million or, or over 100 million in earnings. This year, obviously, you can see uh, it's been a tough environment. I mentioned the Blunders tax credit whole bunch of uncertainty about the renewable fuel standard that I'm sure Grant's going to talk about a little bit more. Uh, you had uh, feedstock prices that uh, took a long time to adjust to the different environment and folks producing uh, even though uh, they're probably doing it at a loss. So when you look at the eight million first two quarters, I'm actually fairly proud of that number. What it shows is uh, despite the most difficult environment, uh, at least in the last five or so years in biodiesel, biomass-based diesel, we actually managed to make a little bit of money, uh, which I think shows the strength of the business. The bottom right shows our balance sheet position, 126 million cash on hand, uh, networking capital of uh, upwards of 200 million, total assets just went over a billion dollars this year. Uh, and we also just produced our uh, billionth, or sold, sorry, sold our billionth gallon of biomass-based di biomass diesel uh, earlier this year, which uh, over the past 20 years, you know, shows, um, you know, significant, I guess, investment and growth in what we've been doing. Term debt, uh, shown there at 250 million, a little bit misleading. It's more like 150 million. We've got a 100 million that's uh, backstopping bonds that we just put in place to finance a new acquisition that I'll get into later. So as I mentioned, we're a publicly traded company under the ticker REGI and the NASDAQ, uh, market cap of a little bit over 400 million. Um, stock price went up yesterday, so that uh, number should go up a little bit too. We hope it's a lot more soon. Uh, so when we were thinking about how to structure our business uh, and, and growing over time into different areas, uh, there's been a lot of talk today about the petro traditional petrochemical complex, uh, oil and gas. Uh, so REG has set up its business model to really mimic uh, that complex. So you see at the bottom, you take you know, crude oil that comes out of the ground, you refine it uh, in a different chemical and fuel cuts. You have sales, marketing, and distribution, and then ultimately end customers. So we do all of the same things in our business except for produce feedstock, and we may actually produce feedstock down the road uh, where it makes sense in targeted markets, but that's not uh, what we do today. We see ourselves as a biorefiner. Um, today it's mostly waste, fats, and greases, but uh, all you know, fats, oils, and greases that go into biodiesel or biomass-based diesel. Um, also talk about a renewable chemicals platform that we recently invested in that we're going to be commercializing. Uh, taking those products and selling them through a couple different subsidiaries um, to do the sales, marketing, distribution. Uh, but we do all those things ourselves, whereas a lot of companies in the space uh, outsource those functions. 
So yeah, I mentioned sales, marketing. Uh, we moved 260 million gallons of fuel last year. Feedstock coming in to our plants, uh, finished product going out without owning one truck, rail car, or barge. Uh, and we sold in 43 different states across the country. So it's a huge logistics effort, but we're doing it all in-house, centralized in Ames. Uh, and we're able to, I guess, capture the full value of the products that we ultimately sell to customers, which are petroleum companies sometimes. Uh, you know, we fight with them on the regulatory front and the political front, but we actually have very good relationships with them uh, on the customer front uh, so they can meet their renewable fuel obligations. And then also to the, you know, job or community and uh, further downstream. So I mentioned, you know, the barrel of oil. We're really targeting the distillate portion and that other portion right there, which is where our renewable chemicals will go into. When it comes down to it, if we're going to uh, wean ourselves or transition ourselves away from being so reliant on uh, uh, petroleum products, we're gonna have to replace each one of those fractions. So ethanol is doing a good job, and cellulosic ethanol, as Dr. Brown mentioned, is doing a good job on the gasoline side. On the distillate side, obviously there's biodiesel. Now we have renewable diesel. Biodiesel is an oxygenate, um, so it needs to be blended with diesel. Uh, and there's, you know, certain limits based on the application as far as blending. Renewable diesel, on the other hand, can go 100% straight drop-in product into the traditional fuel and infrastructure and pipelines. And so they're products that uh, have different advantages, both from a production standpoint and a sales standpoint, uh, but we like them both. So this gives you a snapshot of the products. Uh, probably too small a font to read all of them, but we've got uh, uh, three different uh, well, a whole different range of biodiesel products, uh, depending on the application, whether you're cold weather climates, warm weather climates. Uh, we've got renewable diesel, I mentioned that. We also have renewable naphtha, uh, which is a uh, gasoline blend stock. Um, uh, renewable LPG or propane. Uh, all three of those last three products I mentioned are produced at our Geismer, Louisiana, renewable diesel plant. And then we have recently set up an REG Energy Services outfit that uh, buys traditional petroleum products, diesel today, and uh, either sells that to downstream to say the heating well market. Um, but the real goal for getting into that business is so that we can blend higher and higher amounts of biofuels uh, into the pool. And we don't have to give up the blend margin or the incentive that we have to give someone else in order to get our product uh, down to customers. Uh, heating oil, I mentioned, is a big focus of ours recently in the Northeast as a counter-cyclical market to traditional biodiesel, which is better in the warmer months. Uh, we also sell into the ag industry, um, into uh, industrial processes and pharmaceuticals with our uh, couple different grades of glycerin. Um, we'll actually have, uh, over time, uh, more ph pharmaceutical grade glycerin, USP glycerin that uh, gets added to that portfolio. Um, and we'll also take that glycerin, it's really just a sugar product and ferment it into higher value chemicals over time through our life sciences group. Fatty acid distillate and distillation bottoms are other co-products that we sell. And really what, what I've been describing is uh, what we view as an integration of biotech, agriculture, traditional energy, multi-feedstock, multi-product, multi-technology, uh, manufacturing, sales and marketing, you know, that full uh, integrated supply chain and we've been opportunistic around our biodiesel plants. We got uh, nine biodiesel plants that are operational, renewable diesel plant as well. And we've been opportunistic about buying sites uh, in and around, either through acquisition or, or after the fact, uh, around those biorefineries because we're fully cognizant that to look like the petroleum industry, when they're, they've got refineries cutting that barrel of oil into 50 different things, we need to do the same thing with the fats, oils, and greases, and the sugars, and whatever other product uh, is coming from the ag industry into that location. So over time, I've mentioned the growth. Uh, started in 1996 uh, out of West Central Cooperative, 15th largest ag co-op uh, in the country. Uh, built the first uh, real biodiesel plant in the country uh, in 1996. That was a one million gallon plant. And then West Central made the bet that they were gonna build a 12 million gallon plant in Ralston, Iowa, that was three times the size of the industry back in 2002, the first continuous flow biodiesel plant in the country. Um, that was successful. It actually remains, uh, at least this year, um, given some of the feedstock prices, one of our best performing plants, uh, interestingly. Very uh, 
some might call it simple technology, but it works. Uh, and we took that platform, or West Central did at the time, and there was a lot of other capital going into biodiesel at the time, and decided the best business unit is to set up an engineering and construction firm to take that core biodiesel technology and build plants for others. So we built 10 or 15 plants uh, in different areas of the country, uh, mostly based in the Midwest for others. And then there were tough times in the biodiesel industry. Uh, a lot of product was going over to Europe. Europe, Europe put in tariffs. Uh, the US market was tough. And what it meant was a company like REG, who hadn't invested all the capital into these assets, was able to go back and roll up a whole bunch of the plants in particular that we had built. We knew they were good assets. We were actually managing a bunch of them on behalf of others and bring them together into one uh, larger business. So we did that you know, period of consolidation in 2010, 2011. Um, in total, 15 different acquisitions in the last you know, five or so years. So we have a M&A shop that's been very busy. Last two are renewable chemicals and gas to liquids technologies, including the renewable diesel plant that I'll get into, LS9 and Centrolium. Now we have 100, or sorry, 332 million gallons of capacity across nine uh, biomass-based diesel plants and one fermentation facility through our RG Life Sciences group down in Florida. And then we have four plants that were in, are in some stages of construction. Two of them we got through acquisition, Clovis in Atlanta, uh, that needed work. Um, the Emporia and New Orleans plants, I mentioned biodiesel went on hard times back in the two, uh, 2008 time frame. We were building our own plants then and the market uh, went in a downturn. We actually decided to, one of the hardest things we had to do, halt construction, and decided and said it was better to go buy finished plants that others uh, had uh, finished off. But we still do intend to finish those uh, four plants and working on financing to get that done. And the other thing I'll mention is uh, all but two of those plants are multi-feedstock. So we've invested heavily. We just did a $20 million uh, upgrade at Albert Lee same type of $20 million upgrade at Mason City. Uh, we're doing a $10 or $11 million upgrade at our REG Newton plant. Um, all of those investments are going in to make our plants fully multi-feedstock capable. So we can take inedible corn oil, which is a really tough to process waste product of the ethanol industry, use cooking oil from restaurants, uh, in animal fats uh, that uh, have a whole bunch of stuff in them. Um, and we can take those uh, waste uh, products and turn them into a good quality finished fuel through processing. It's the highest margin opportunities, uh, but they are the hardest things to process. You can see our corporate footprint. Uh, we've got 26 terminals uh, all across the country. Those are really our retail centers. If we're not selling direct to the oil and gas companies, uh, we're uh, sending product there and uh, folks can pick it up and blend it, or we do the blending at certain of our ter terminals as well. You see our green plant assets and our yellow uh, plants we want to finish. This is how we've uh, structured the company, uh, all bankruptcy remote. For the most part, we try and keep our debt at our subsidiary levels. And uh, this is intended to ensure that any plant uh, has problems, goes down, fire, whatever, that it's not going to bring down the parent. And that includes our service-based subsidiaries as well. Traditional hub and spokes model uh, have kind of touched on that with customers and terminals. Everything besides actually processing Fats, oils, and greases that come into our plants is centralized in AIMS, sales, marketing, technical support, all that. The key uh, to how we make our money is really the disconnect um, between oil prices and uh, ultimately diesel prices, and also the disconnect between uh, lower, relatively lower cost animal uh, fats and used cooking oil and edible corn oil and you know, highly refined soybean oil, which is much more expensive Again, easier to process. It includes canola and palm as well. But it, I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but 83% of what we did last year put through our plants was waste fats and greases that were otherwise, would otherwise have a much lower value um, or uh, be thrown, up, th thrown away or landfilled. Renewable fuel standard, I'm going to let Grant talk more about that. Uh, we have an industry that uh, EPA is proposing to propose to uh, freeze uh, our volume requirement at 1.28 billion gallons, and we're hopeful that that gets increased substantially. Industry produced 1.7 billion last year, so you can see uh, why it would be tough to live in another 1.28 uh, regime. 
These are where we want to grow, so we want to continue to invest in our biodiesel or biomass-based diesel assets. We also want to do a lot of the stuff that Dr. Brown talked about as far as investing in other biofuels and biochemicals uh, platforms uh, and bioproducts, diversify in other env environmental type services, and then you're going to see us uh, in the near term um, or medium term grow significantly internationally. Uh, there's other markets that are like the U.S. that are just ripe for being rolled up into a broader international business that can compete uh, in the distillate marketplace. RRG Life Sciences, uh, I know I'm running on time right now, but very cool platform, takes any type of sugar product, genetically engineered E. coli, uh, and uh, converts those sugars to, uh, think of it like an oil-based product that is secreted from the E. coli, rises to the top, and you can easily separate the chemical product from the fermentation broth and uh, take it into a wide range of chemicals. And we're focused or initially on the fatty acid methyl ester uh, uh, platform, lower carbon chains than what biodiesel is, uh, and then also fatty alcohols and esters. This just shows a quick snapshot of um, the re reduction in time to get to these different chemicals that we engineer our bugs to uh, produce. And you can see that the first uh, product that LS9 wanted to do was Fame. That took almost seven years to commercialize or get to uh, uh, commercial uh, ready yields. Uh, right now we're in the you know, matter of less than a year uh, and months to get to those different chemical products. For, we have a fermentation facility down in Florida that will be uh, ramping up here soon to produce those initial products. The last one I'll mention is uh, that LS9 acquisition was uh, up to $65 million uh, acquisition that we did earlier this year. And we uh, also did earlier this year the acquisition of Centrolium Corporation for around uh, 40 to $45 million. And then we bought uh, the jointly owned plant uh, that they had with Dynamic Fuels um, from Tyson Foods and Centrolium. That altogether was a $200 million acquisition and uh, we've told the markets that we are uh, preparing to start that up um, very soon. So excited about that. Uh, provides different products uh, for our company. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Grant Mankey. I'm the policy director for the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association, and we represent um, Iowa's liquid renewable fuels producers, the ethanol producers, biodiesel, as well as cellulosic biofuel producers. And uh, I'm pleased to be here today to talk about the current needs of the renewable fuels community. I want to first thank the University of Iowa, the Public Policy Center, and the Fork and Brock series on public policy for having this discussion today. Meeting the Renewable Energy Challenge, in the words of the great scholar Ron Burgundy, is kind of a big deal. And we really need to focus on this. And I feel passionately that the liquid renewable fuels industry, primarily, I mean, with Iowa as the leader, has a huge uh, place, has a huge position to play in our uh, energy portfolio going forward. So Iowa, we lead the way in a lot of things. We're the, you know, first in the nation caucuses. We've got the best state fair in the world. We've got number one in corn, number one in soybeans, number one in eggs, number one in pork. We're also the undisputed leader in renewable fuels production and innovation. We're number one in ethanol. We've got 3.8 billion gallons of ethanol capacity, 42 ethanol plants. I'm going to date myself here. I graduated from high school in 1998. How many dry mill ethanol plants do you suppose there were in 1998? That's right, zero. There were none. Today there's 35, 42 total plants. We produce two and a half times more ethanol in this state than we consume in gasoline. That is a tremendous amount of progress and innovation that has been made since I graduated from high school 18, well, 16 years ago, whatever it was. We're also number one in biodiesel. We've got 12 biodiesel plants with the capacity to produce 300 million gallons of biodiesel. As Nate alluded to, we're, uh, we can make it out of 
a variety of different oils and fats, soy oil, canola oil, and you know, pork fat, chicken fat, beef fat, uh, used cooking grease. It's a very diverse fuel that can be made in a variety of places. And we're traditionally moving to those lower carbon intensity feedstocks, which is exciting, and the technologies that are happening. Anyone want to guess how many biodiesel plants there were when I graduated from high school in 1998? Once again, that's right, there were none, zero. So we've gone from zero to 12 since 1998, pretty impressive. We're also number one in cellulosic biofuel, and Robert Brown, Dr. Brown did an excellent job of giving an update there. Um, Poet DSM in Emmitsburg has just begun production uh, this past month uh, at their Project Liberty facility in Emmitsburg, Iowa. They're going to be able to produce 20 to 25 million gallons of cellulosic ethanol from corn cobs, corn husks, corn stover, um, and the phantom fuel is, is here and it's, and it's very exciting. Quad County Corn Processors, our smallest dry mill ethanol plant in the state uh, with the innovation from a, an Iowa State University educated engineer, sorry University of Iowa folks, he, he did go to Iowa State, invented this process in their R&D lab to make ethanol out of corn kernel fiber. Now traditionally ethanol is made out of corn starch. By making additional ethanol out of the corn kernel fiber, they can increase their production by 6% and not use an additional kernel of corn. It also makes their feed product more concentrated, higher in protein, which is uh, important for certain animal species, and it, it uh, exponentially increases their production of corn oil, which can then be used in the biodiesel industry. Uh, DuPont cellulosic ethanol. They are building a plant here uh, you know, in Nevada, Iowa. That plant is going to be up and running by the end of the year, a 25 to 30 million gallon plant uh, making cellulosic ethanol out of corn stover. And finally, this one's not as far off the ground, but Fiberite has a plant in Blairstown, Iowa, just west of uh, Cedar Rapids, which intends to uh, make the first commercial scale uh, trash in all plant, that is to make cellulosic ethanol using municipal solid waste. The saying goes, the only you know, sure things in life are death and taxes, but whenever you've got humans around, trash is also a certainty. So this is also a fuel, if it can be commercially viable, that has exciting opportunities to you know, be able to, to create this fuel in a, in anywhere where there's people, because where there's people, there's going to be trash. I just want to make the point, you know, I attended last night's debate and it was a fantastic discussion, you know, on can we get to 100% renewable energy by 2030 or can we not get there? And I, I come down somewhere in the middle on there, um, but it seemed like both sides of the argument seemed to be running as far away from liquid renewable fuels as they possibly could. And I'm telling you, the, the, the leadership, the innovation that we have here in this state and what we're doing with you know, 62,000 jobs uh, directly or indirectly supported by the renewable fuels industry is not something to be ashamed of. In fact, this is something that we can be very proud of. And the future is very bright and we are just getting started. Um, and so I'm really thrilled to be talking with you about that today. Now the industry does have some challenges and that's what I wanna talk about next. Number one, uh, challenge is market access. We need to be able to get our fuel in front of the consumer. Now this is a challenge. We are trying to sell our product in an entrenched infrastructure that is virtually a petroleum distribution monopoly by the oil companies. They control the refineries, they control the pipelines, what goes into the pipeline, what comes out of the pipeline, where it comes out of the pipeline, and 53% of retail gasoline stations around the country fly under the flag of a, a major oil brand or refiner who has branded contracts that restrict what types of fuel products can be offered by retailers. So market access is a huge, huge issue. And what does market access look like from our perspective? Well, here's an example. This is a pump in Nevada, Iowa. This is called a blender pump or a flex fuel pump. And you can see there the red option is your standard E10 gasoline. Uh, this is taken a little while ago, so the prices have obviously gone down a bit. 
but it offers the consumer a choice. If they drive a 2001 or newer vehicle, they can choose E10, they can choose E15 if they want and save four cents a gallon. Or if they own a flex fuel vehicle, they can choose E20, E30, or E85. Once again, you're putting the power of choice in the hands of the consumer, and you know that is, that is all we're trying to do. And uh, we're making progress in that regard, but we're finding resistance wherever we go. Um, the oil industry is not particularly interested in giving up market share, but we're fighting hard to expand market access. The most important piece in expanding market access is the renewable fuel standard. Uh, Nate talked about it a little bit earlier. Basically, it's a policy that was put into place in 2005 at the federal level. It was expanded in 2007, and what it does is it sets out specific volume targets for obligated parties, which are oil companies and oil importers, that they must blend a minimum volume of renewable fuels in the transportation fuel sector. Um, when this policy was expanded in 2007, it laid out a 15-year blueprint for how we were going to transition to lower carbon, uh, cleaner, and cheaper renewable, homegrown renewable fuels. The RFS is currently in turmoil, as you all know. Um, the rule was proposed November 15th of last year. There were significant cuts proposed by the, the current administration to the renewable fuel standard for uh, first generation ethanol, for biodiesel, and for advanced biofuels. Um, if those cuts are finalized, it would essentially turn the policy upside down, and uh, we are very hopeful that a, a, a you know, that the rule will be finalized as soon as possible. We're expecting it to happen not until after the election. Um, and if that is the case, we don't expect the result to be uh, to, to our benefit. But with market access comes fuel competition. Why is fuel competition important? This chart kind of gives you a perspective on what a difference between a competitive market and a virtual monopoly market can look like. The red line is gas prices over time since 1976. The blue line is residential electricity prices. As you can see, there's a lot more volatility in that retail gas price. And why is that? Well, from 19, it, there's a lot of reasons, let's be honest. But from 1976 to today, there has been, we have ranged from 100% dependence on petroleum for our transportation fuel needs, now we're at 90% dependence. Not a whole lot of competition there. Whereas with the electricity side, you do have a competitive marketplace. You've got coal, you've got natural gas, you've got wind, you've got solar, you've got geothermal, you've got hydroelectric, you've got nuclear. And that creates price stability and that's what fuel competition can do to the marketplace. So that's, we are hoping to expand fuel choice for consumers, uh, competitive price, competitive marketplace to lower prices. We also need a level playing field. Um, this chart pretty much sums it up. The federal policy playing field is stacked in favor of the oil industry. Period. End of story. Uh, the oil industry has had tax subsidies since the inception of the tax code in 1913, and industry-specific tax subsidies. They are part of permanent law. They never come up for review. Um, they don't expire every five years or every ten years, um, so they are a permanent part of the tax code. Renewable fuels have no current federal tax uh, credits. You know, we are fighting to get back a biodiesel tax credit and a cellulosic tax credit, but ethanol's tax credit went away in 2011. And you got to wonder why it makes sense to continue to give uh, industry-specific policy support to the most rich and powerful industry in the history of industries. The federal use mandate, I mean, I won't go into all of this, but this is an, an interesting one that most people don't think about too much. But the, you know, federal law says that if you don't drive a flex fuel vehicle, you must put a fuel in your car that contains a minimum of 85% petroleum. That, folks, is a mandate. And people talk about this evil RFS is where, you know, we're getting close to requiring that 10% of our fuel comes from renewables. I'll take their mandate over our mandate any day. And you can see those other things there. I, I won't beat it, uh, you know, to death. But 
the, the, the policy deck is stacked in favor of the oil industry and we are trying to level that playing field. And once again, the RFS is the best way to do that for the reasons I stated earlier. We also need policy certainty. This last year has been a whirlwind with the upheaval of the RFS at the federal level, the expiration of the biodiesel tax credit and cellulosic tax credit. Here's that DuPont project in Nevada once again. You know, the, the advertised sticker price for this plant is about a quarter of a billion dollars that they've invested here. And we're confident that this plant's going to work and it's going to be producing fuel here by the end of the year. But the question is, where is serial number two going to be? Is it going to be here in Iowa? Is it going to be in the United States? Or is it going to be in China or South America or Europe where they are, you know, putting out very... Uh, uh, they're, they're trying very hard to get these companies to invest in their, uh, in their countries. So policy certainty, once again, standing behind the RFS at the federal level, will send a signal that you can invest here in America and we can continue to innovate with these cleaner, lower carbon intensity fuels. And finally, we need to tell our story and win with the truth. There's a lot of noise, a lot of talk about renewable fuels, and a lot of it is not positive from our standpoint. But we need to do a better job of telling our story. And I'm just going to give one brief example here. And, you know, we hear a lot about corn prices and retail food prices. Well, if anyone followed the corn markets this year, the price of corn is at a five-year low. When the RFS was put into place in 2007, the price of corn was $4.34. Yesterday it closed for around $3.50. So corn prices are plunging. Have you, so we've gone, and since 2012, the price of corn has dropped in half. By a show of hands, how many of you have seen your food prices drop in half over those two years? No, nope, nobody, no, nope. well, that's because there really isn't a correlation between corn prices and retail food prices. Here's a chart here that shows average corn price versus changes in real retail food prices over time. No real correlation there. How about beef prices? The price of corn is the, uh, the yellow kind of uh, jagged one. Uh, and as you can see, there's no correlation between beef prices and corn prices from 2007 to today. How about pork? No correlation there. Poultry, eggs, not seeing a correlation. Dairy, you get the point. How about as we ramp up ethanol production? Has that raised food prices? What is the annual food inflation trend? Well, as you can see, even though we've ramped up our ethanol production and renewable fuel production drastically, the food price inflation is actually trending downward, so there's no correlation there either. Something has to be explaining these higher food prices, and what could that be? Well, you won't believe it. The food price index and the global crude oil price has a very striking correlation. And why is that? It's because for every food dollar that you spend, only 15 cents of that goes to the farm. 85 cents of that is for uh, mostly energy intensive parts of the, of the process, processing, transportation of fuels, things that require petroleum. And that is a message I want to send today. You know, we are looking at the largest corn crop in world history this year. We're going to have the highest yield, the highest production, and when all uses for corn are, are all demands are realized for food, for feed, for fiber, for exports, for industrial uses, and for fuel, we're still going to be sitting on a pile of corn that is 2 billion bushels, which currently doesn't have a home. So if there are other people who need corn, come to us. We will gladly send it to them. And this just shows you the power of the American farmer. I mean, this is not the, the guys in overalls and straw hats anymore. I mean, these farmers are innovating. They're, I mean, we've got the highest enrollment in ag colleges here in Iowa ever. And, uh, and that's because there's a future in agriculture. And with that future in agriculture comes, you know, a future in renewable fuels. So I've gone over these benefits, rural economic revitalization, lower fuel prices, cleaner air, 
decreased reliance on oil. Um, you know, we need market access. We need increased fuel competition. We need to be less dependent on volatile regions of the world. Let's be honest. We'll be less susceptible to fuel price spikes. This is a little media here, and I'm doubting it's going to work because it usually never does with me. But what this was going to show was a, yeah, it's not going to work. Oh, dear. There it went. I'll just skip to the end here as I'm talking. That was, it was showing footage of us, uh, our, we're currently bombing oil refineries in Iraq and Syria that are now controlled by the terrorist group ISIS. And it just is an ex a striking example of, do we really want to stay 90% dependent on petroleum? I think the answer is no. This is just a picture of my family. I hope that my boys have a future in agriculture. You know, when I lived through the 80s and 90s on the farm, people, my dad said, don't go into agriculture. There's no future here. You know, we're depending on government subsidies and, and you know, I'm not sure where the future is headed. Well, farmers created an industry that is now opening up new markets, new innovations, new opportunities, creating jobs here in Iowa. I'm proud of that, and I'm proud that hopefully my boys will have opportunities here in this state in this field as well. So sorry for going over time, but I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Sorry to, uh, I apologize for being uh, late. I just ran over from a class and I think that I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the environmental impacts of uh, biofuels and perhaps that's my uh, role on, on this panel. But in general, I'm, I'm uh, favorable for biofuels, especially cellulosic uh, biofuels. But uh, I guess the gist of this particular message is that uh, we need to try to improve the environmental performance of these fuels. So uh, as mentioned earlier, the uh, EISA, the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, uh, expanded the renewable fuel standard. And there were really two stated goals in that law. One is for uh, more energy security. Uh, and secondly, that it should, if the country is going to invest in a uh, biofuel mandate, uh, that it should perform better than its replacement fuel, it should perform better than gasoline, so less greenhouse gases than gasoline. And basically it's been up until now reasonably successful in that uh, we've replaced about 10% of the transportation fuels in this country uh, with uh, biofuels, but it has come at an expense. The, there's always trade-offs, and indeed there's trade-offs in this case, it's about 40% of our corn crop is being used uh, to do that. So 10% of the transportation fuel replaced, 40%, a large fraction of the corn crop uh, in order to do it. And uh, because corn is a high input uh, crop, uh, there's some environmental uh, uh, impacts that go along with that. Now we're kind of, as mentioned earlier, we're kind of at the halfway point uh, now in 2014 of the RFS2, the second renewable fuel standard mandate. And that was mandated by Congress. It's, in, it's the rules and enforced by EPA. We want to get to 36 billion gallons of uh, biofuels by 2022. Uh, so it'd be more than 20% of our transportation fuels replaced, helping with energy security, one of the goals. But we're hitting some snags, as you've heard about. Uh, the cellulosic ethanol, which is the purple on this slide, that's the largest wedge uh, which remains is not developing very fast. Uh, despite the fact that we just opened a, a great new plant in Emmitsburg uh, that we've heard about, uh, the cellulosic ethanol itself uh, is having to be uh, backed off. And truthfully, the plants would have to be built now or being built in order for us to meet the RFS2 mandate. So for sure, we're going to fall short of the RFS2 mandate uh, because we, don't, we haven't invested uh, in the technology in order to uh, fulfill it. So EPA is going to have to keep uh, backing off of this. The blend wall is hurting, the $88 price of oil, uh, competing uh, gasoline that needs to be replaced is a, a very low uh, price. That hurts uh, the future of the RFS2. Reduced demand. Last year our miles driven were up a bit, but in general uh, we're conserving more and more oil, that's a good thing. 
I'm for uh, phasing out of oil, coal and natural gas for that matter. So corn ethanol is the biggest uh, biofuel produced, roughly 13 billion gallons per year, but it has come with a trade-off of 40% of the corn crop. The corn crop being a, a high input crop has had environmental impacts. Our, for uh, four decades or five decades, our total agricultural land in production in the U.S. has been very flat. But there have been changes within the uses, and corn has increased relative to some of the other uh, crops out of 400 uh, million acres to roughly 90 million acres uh, each year. And this year will be a bumper crop as shown. So the RFS2 standard has helped to pull more corn acres into uh, uh, agriculture. And uh, it is a, a high input crop requiring here more fertilizers, the top part of the slide, and more pesticides applied than other competing uses of biomass uh, or uh, other biofuels as well, you know, including sin fuels. So as we have more and more corn acreage and more and more uh, fertilizers applied, if you get a rain, uh, corn's kind of a leaky crop. Some of the uh, nitrate and uh, fertilizers and pesticides run off and cause water quality impacts. Uh, unfortunately, eastern Iowa and Illinois are some of the highest uh, e uh, uh, lands draining to the Mississippi River for nitrogen ye yields and phosphorus yields as shown here. The browner the color, the higher the yield, and we can lose maybe 10% of the nitrogen in a given year. Uh, in our flood year 2008, we calculated that was roughly a billion dollars of uh, fertilizer lost from the farms down the Mississippi River calling, causing water quality problems here and down there, uh, both along the way. And uh, uh, the dead zone is not improving in the Gulf of uh, Mexico, uh, maybe 20,000 square kilometers uh, in size uh, uh, on average. Uh, an area where fish and uh, shellfish uh, have to vacate for part of the year because of low oxygen uh, concentrations. Now the Ethanol facilities are the black dots on this particular uh, map from the USGS and the larger the size of the dot, the larger the production facility and you can see that Iowa in the Midwest, the Corn Belt has a lot of black dots. Uh, I first would like to mention the dots on the red, the Ogallala Aquifer in kind of the Nebraska, Oklahoma, uh, Panhandle of Texas area. Those production facilities are using all the corn in the vicinity around there to produce uh, ethanol biofuel. And unfortunately, uh, they're pumping down the Ogallala Aquifer. So uh, this renewable fuel is causing an unsustainable uh, environmental impact, and that is the uh, mining of the aquifer. But even in the uh, rain-fed part of the world, the agricultural Midwest here in Iowa, uh, there's issues regarding uh, the water that we have to think about because the black dots, the production facilities, require high purity water. And that high purity water generally comes from aquifers. And even though we t with the climate change we're tending to more high intensity storms, nevertheless we are pumping down our aquifers here too. So at the production facility, it's roughly three gallons of water for a newer plant per gallon of ethanol produced. But in uh, Nebraska, on the Ogallala, uh, if you count the irrigation water, we're talking about more than 1,000 gallons of water per gallon of ethanol produced. So you know when you drive your flex fuel vehicle up to a, a pump and you put in 10 gallons of uh, corn ethanol, you're actually, uh, in Nebraska, you're actually putting in maybe 10,000 gallons of water equivalent. So it's a, it's a big water user at a time when we're drawing down our aquifers and eventually we'll need to replace our aquifers. So I hope that we can uh, develop cellulosic uh, ethanol, second and third generation biofuels that have been talked about here, and even replace the corn ethanol with cellulosic 
ethanol in the future. That would be uh, my goal, something more sustainable. You would use less water, less uh, energy inputs, uh, not a food crop, uh, but rather perennial crops uh, with roots that help to hold the soil and not lose the soil by erosion. So I applaud the uh, cellulosic ethanol plant in Emmitsburg. I hope uh, many more are successful. It holds the promise for a better environmental footprint for the future. Because of a different feedstock, uh, corn cobs and uh, corn stover, uh, possibly switchgrass uh, in the future, uh, all of which would have lower inputs than corn and a better environmental footprint. Uh, the cellulosic ethanol around the nation would come from uh, indeed corn, corn stover, but also maybe re wood residues and dedicated bioenergy crops. Uh, but we need to get up to 16 billion gallons per year by 2022, according to the renewable fuel mandate. And that looks pretty difficult uh, right now. But if we could do that, hopefully the environmental uh, impact in terms of water, fertilizers, energy would be much better than what we're doing now. It's controversial. Uh, you may know that uh, not everyone comes up with the same life cycle assessment for what we're doing now. EPA concludes in the upper right-hand corner of this slide that corn ethanol emits only 75 grams of greenhouse gases per million joules of ethanol fuel equivalent and that gasoline was 93 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per million joules, and that's acceptable by EPA standards, a 20% improvement. But not everybody comes up with that, and for uh, cellulosic uh, fuels, it has to be a 60% reduction. So this slide is from a 2013 paper just showing that if you include indirect land use changes, uh, both uh, corn ethanol and uh, switchgrass has some uh, fraction of its, dis of, of its uh, function exceeding the gasoline replacement. That's the mm, logical uh, re um, standard that EPA uses is what are we uh, replacing the fuels and that's gasoline. One recent issue uh, you may have heard about is that uh, even if we use corn stover like in the Emmitsburg plant, and if we take too much off of the land, that's carbon that doesn't go into the soil. And so if we lose, uh, ero if our erosion increases due to that removal from the land, and if there's not that additional mass of material to become incorporated into the soil, we could also not, we could fail to meet the EPA um, life cycle rule of a 60% improvement over gasoline. And uh, this is the work of Adam Liska at the University of Nebraska just showing that he thinks uh, the soil carbon loss as a result of removing the stover is an environmental improvement that we, we need to avoid that. We need to improve this if we're going to uh, meet the mandate for the future. So as was mentioned, uh, uh, EPA is proposing to back off of the renewable fuel standard. What's particularly in question right now is the lowest, the fourth row on this slide, the cellulosic biofuels which are projected uh, to grow according to the mandate. And we simply don't have the plants right now in order to produce that cellulosic uh, biofuel. And so that part of the mandate is called into question. Uh, corn ethanol production has peaked. Cellulosic biofuels are a bit slow to develop. I hope that improves. Uh, we now face decreased gasoline consumption. Demand is down. That's a good thing, actually. Uh, oil prices are, are low, and the blend wall, as has been said, are all affecting the future of our renewable fuels. And hopefully there's many challenges, but uh, hopefully the environmental impact will lessen as we develop the renewable fuel standard in the future. Biofuels in RFS2 do face challenges. Cellulosic biofuels hold a promise for a better uh, environmental future, but definitely the mandate won't be um, met regardless right now just due to a lack of investment and facilities uh, and the other factors that we've talked about. The first generation biofuels use a lot of water, fertilizers, energy, 
and that's why in some uh, places they've gotten a bad name. They should eventually, in my view, be replaced by the uh, advanced biofuels, the cellulosic biofuels, and that should be our, our goal that I hope we can uh, endorse. Also, I don't know what was mentioned, I missed uh, uh, earlier talks, but the co-products are a very important part of the story which I haven't had time to talk about, and one that makes uh, cellulosic uh, biofuels and biorefinery uh, even more attractive for the future. Thanks very much. So with that, we have plenty of time for questions, and there are people around with microphones. Um, if you have questions for our panelists. I would like to ask Professor Schnorr about those co-products that are produced with the cellulosic energy. Well, I think I'd actually turn over to my colleagues. Uh, Robert Brown, would you? field that question of what uh, co-products might we expect from the biorefinery in the second and third generation fuels? Happily, and I, I call it the DDGs of the cellulosic ethanol industry. Yeah, thanks. And it's lignin. And lignin is the glue that holds carbohydrate together in, in wood. Uh, lignin is, has been described as, uh, you know, this remarkable material that we don't have markets for yet. We haven't, as they say, you can do anything but make money with it. Uh, so we're trying, we actually have a group of faculty at Iowa State that are trying to look at how can we use lignin other than just to burn it. Uh, and I think it's a tremendous waste to burn it. Uh, there are so many possibilities. We could, we could produce plastic bottles from lignin. We could produce all kinds of, of, of chemicals that are currently produced from petroleum. And these are going to be much higher value uh, applications, actually, than turning it into a fuel, for example. I would just add to that. In first generation renewable fuels, co-products are a very important part of the puzzle as well. Uh, Professor, Sh Professor Schnorr threw out a statistic that 40% of our corn crop goes to ethanol production. That is not telling the whole story. 40% um, of our corn makes its first stop at the ethanol plant. Remember, one third of every bushel that goes into the ethanol production process comes out the back end in the form of a high protein feed product called distiller's grains, which Mr. Brown alluded to. And that is being utilized, you know, we have produced in the 2013-14 marketing year, 39 million metric tons of animal feed out of the U.S. ethanol industry. If we were our own country, we would be the fourth largest producer of corn in the world behind the United States, Brazil, and China. So discounting the contribution of first generation uh, co-products is just not telling the whole story. Similarly with biodiesel, you've got uh, you know glycerin, which is used in a variety of products. So I would just don't want anyone to leave the impression that co-products are not an important part of first generation too. And could I just get a show of hands? How many people in this audience have actually been to an ethanol plant or a biodiesel plant and toured it? I wish we could all get on a bus right after this and go out and go through one of these because I'm telling you, you know, the, the reputation is, oh, we've got this archaic technology that's not moving forward. That is not the case at all. You Grant, know. Grant, but I got to interrupt you, and that is that, uh, okay, even if we take a third, if we would argue that the quality of the dry distiller's grain is equal to the quality of corn, which is, I think, a big assumption, but even if you do and you take a third off, it's still 27% of the total corn crop being used to make 10% of the transportation fuel. So to most people, I would uh, say that's a pretty large fraction of a of a resource and it's on the order of about uh, 25 to 30 million acres of land dedicated, even subtracting off the uh, dry distiller's grain product. I agree that the dry distiller grain product is a very important part of first generation uh, ethanol and I didn't mean to uh, demean it, but it's still a huge fraction of the total industry that's used to uh, make ethanol to replace 10%. And I'm just simply asking the question, is that worth it? And I don't want to argue with Professor Schnorr, but 26% and 40% are drastically different numbers, so I would encourage him to update the number in his slide. And also, uh, you know, like I said, 
we have plenty of corn for any end use. At the end of this year, two billion bushels that don't have a home. So if there are other uses for corn, by all means, let's use them. There's two billion bushels sitting there ready for anyone to use. Some other questions? Uh, hi. Uh, many economists have uh, recommended that we implement a tax on carbon as it comes into the market in order to level the play playing field for renewable fuels. Um, Considering the high input costs of corn and uh, many of the biofuels, how would a carbon tax affect your industry? Would it be a good thing or a bad thing? So I can respond to that. I mean, uh, it's not um, a carbon tax uh, necessarily, but if you look at California, they have, they have the low carbon fuel standard. And that's really based on the carbon intensity of the life cycle of the production process. Uh, that's been a uh, on and off market for biodiesel or renewable diesel. Uh, but what I'll say is, you know, things like inedible corn oil, that's an ethanol co-product, by the way, uh, that actually has the lowest carbon intensity score of pretty much anything you can think of. It's a four megajoule or grams per megajoule versus, uh, you know, traditional diesel's up at 96. Biodiesel made out of animal fats is at 30. I mean, so you can see uh, on a relative basis, the significant reduction as you go down the uh, chain and, and look at the waste products, the things that would ordinarily not get used, that can't go into food maybe, um, or that are uh, yeah, uh, going to lower value uses. If you can take those things, low carbon uh, type feedstocks, and convert them, um, you know, sure, it's uh, I think a good model. The renewable fuel standard is set up to almost be a carbon intensity uh, type gauge as well, um, based on the preference for cellulose, certain preferences for biomass-based diesel, which uh, you should, saw on uh, one of Professor Schnur's uh, slides, 50% reduction for biomass-based diesel. Well, that's actually the bottom uh, level. So if you do the waste uh, feedstocks uh, conversion to fuels, that's an 86% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions compared to a diesel baseline. Uh, that's Question. right. If, if they meet the EPA uh, standards, actually Congress mandated, it was a very prescriptive law, if they meet those performance standards, it should fare well under a carbon tax structure. And under the RFS, too, also, the, remember, they're comparing renewable fuels to a baseline gas, petroleum, gasoline, and diesel from 2005. That's from 2005. Now, the carbon intensity of petroleum has gone up since 2005. So every year that goes by, carbon intensity of renewable fuels continues to go down, whereas the carbon intensity of fossil fuels continues to go up. So while we're talking about low carbon, I'm just going to throw this possibility out. Why don't we think about carbon negative fuels? Mm -hmm. Could we actually achieve that? And think, what would that require? Right now, we take uh, fossil resources out of the ground where they've been sequestering carbon, burn them, and dump it into the atmosphere. Could we actually re reverse that process? Now, does that violate the second law of thermodynamics? I teach thermodynamics, so I'm not going to suggest it does. Uh, but it would require us to use renewable energy to pull that carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester some part of it back in the ground. Uh, there are a number of proposals to do that. We're doing one of those at Iowa State University, and it's based on pyrolysis, where we take biomass that has pulled carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, uh, fixed it as cellulose and lignin, and when we pyrolyze it, most of it goes to a, a liquid product, but part of it goes to a solid product. You would know it as charcoal from a campfire, and you sequester that in soils. People say, well, why would you do that? Nature has been doing that for the last 10,000 years in Iowa. It has been estimated that uh, 20 percent, and we have one faculty member says it can be as high as 50 percent of the soil organic matter in Iowa soils is charcoal from what? Prairie fires over 10,000 years. And that has actually sequestered along with other biological processes, sequestered an incredible amount of carbon in the soils. So I just raised that possibility. So Pat, you had a question. Uh, yes, it's been a pleasure to hear about the success of so many of these advanced cellulosic plants. Um, a lot of those were put in place with funding from the Iowa Power Fund. They mm -hmm. led the dollars there. 
and now we've got to follow up with EPSCOR funding, but where will the funding come for in the future? Um, that would be my question. Thank you. Well, that sounds like a question for the academic. <laughs> in terms of doing the research, uh, I think the model that works extremely well is for an industry to be profitable, and then they have money to invest in the research. Right now, when you look at something like the cellulosic ethanol industry, it is not currently profitable. It, I hope it will be shortly with these demonstration of technology in, in Iowa. Once it is, you will see uh, investment in that area. Uh, certainly, the federal government has been investing in that area, but you know, the real money in R&D, people don't realize it actually comes from industry. Uh, not necessarily spent at universities, but if you look at the total research investment, it comes from industry that is making a profit in what they're doing. And I would just say that policy certainty is the, the, biggest, the biggest thing as far as that goes. Knowing that, you know, there's a policy there that you can depend on. And there's some good programs there. The Farm Bill Energy Title has programs for uh, biomass crop assistance program, the biorefinery assistance program, uh, the bioenergy program for advanced biofuels. So there are farm bill programs out there and there will be an effort to extend the cellulosic ethanol and biodiesel uh, tax credits as well going ahead. So, um, so yeah, those are things that are out there but policy certainty is paramount when it comes to the future growth of this industry. So we have, we have two more questions, one over here, and then the last one over on this side. Um, we have learned with uh, Professor Sch Schoenler, Schoenler, uh about the harm the fertilizers cause in the Mississippi River Basin. And uh, I have a question. Do Iowa crops use fertigation as a fertilization technique? If not, why? I'm sorry, do Iowa crops use what? Fertigation, uh, fertilization using the leftover, uh, sorry, the residues from desolation of corn and the process. Uh, it's a fertigation, fertigation. Use the vinas or something oh. like that as we use uh, for sure. sugar cane. I, I'm not sure of the answer to your question. Uh, we do use, of course, uh, manure and uh, all forms of uh, fertilizers, but Fertigation, anybody want to comment on that? Other than, certainly corn stover remains on the fields and in part of building soil carbon and putting nutrients back in the yeah. soil. I mean, uh, because... Well, we do apl apply uh, sewage sludge amendments to agricultural land. Is, is that a... Yeah, because, because, for example, <laughs> in the sugar cane crops, uh, when they, they uh, after the desolation uh, process, they also have a residue that okay. is very uh, useful for fertilization. And I don't know if we have something similar for corn exactly. and if it's possible yeah, to yeah, use in order yeah. to reduce chemicals so in the fertilization. I think you're referring to bagasse. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and the ash and, from burning it also. Yes, yeah, so corn stover is equivalent to bagasse. But so is this biochar that I proposed in the thermal chemical processes would be a similar amendment. So, and with, go, on, go ahead. Just with the cellulosic ethanol projects that are out there, uh, they're you know being very careful in terms of the amount of biomass that they're harvesting from these fields. It's you know agriculture is very complex now. Fields have GPS technology, so they know the the soil nutrient needs of different parts of a person's field. And so they can strategically take off stover in areas where the soil doesn't need it as, as much versus areas that do need it as much. So, you know, Mr. Liska's analysis, uh, while it presented some interesting conclusions that, that said that, oh, we're, there could be tremendous damage from taking huge amounts of stover off. And he's right, but no one is proposing to take off the amounts of stover that Mr. Liska is suggesting. So. We we'll just want to make that clear. One last question over here. My question is somewhat related. So where you produce the feedstock, the corn or the sugar cane or whatever, will have an impact on how much environmental, adverse environmental impact you have. So basically my question is, does the renewable fuel standard allow uh, refiners to blend with ethanol or, or renewable fuels from other countries? And if not, why not? 
it does. Uh, the RFS is a WTO compliant policy. And so, yes, sugarcane ethanol from Brazil uh, comes in. Um, not as much as some would expect. And, and there's been uh, biodiesel that has been uh, brought into this country as well. So, so yes, it does allow for uh, fuels from other countries. And there's, proposals there's to export ethanol from the U.S. as to other markets as well. Absolutely. There is continuous trade going on. We're the largest ethanol producer in the world, but we trade with uh, Brazil, and depending on the prices in the current time, it's going uh, both both directions. And interesting, the uh, uh, bagasse and the sugarcane ethanol production in Brazil is uh, given an advanced biofuel uh, rating by EPA in the life cycle assessment. They're quite efficient. So let's thank our speakers one more time. Thank you very much.